Are you saying Cristiano Ronaldo, the underwear model, he still plays soccer? It's hard to think of a bigger star. He's one of the biggest global billboards in the world. Cristiano Ronaldo playing in Saudi Arabia. You would not have thunk that a few years earlier. There we go. Saudi Arabia has its first permanent mega pitch man. This episode of World Corrupt is brought to you by Zbiotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic. Your first drink for a better tomorrow. Welcome back to World Corrupt Season 2, Episode 3. Oh, I feel like at this point, I think we could all use a group hug, right? And I don't just say that because anxiety and self-loathing are our factory settings, Tommy. Self-loathing is my passion, Raj. But for the listeners out there, uh, you should go back and listen to Episode 1 and 2, for this episode to make any sense at all. But in case you don't feel like it, respect to you. I respect your time. Here's a quick recap. You're assuming people do want any of this to make sense at all. Sometimes not knowing, oh, it's just like a beautiful warm bath. But we are the podcast equivalent of TLDR. But episode one was all about Saudi Arabia snatching up sporting global properties and particularly football properties left and right, including Premier League sleeping giant Newcastle United, a once great team in coal country, a in the northeast of England. And then in episode two, we traced the rise of MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the 38-year-old de facto leader of Saudi Arabia. Ruthless and vengeful, MBS's consolidated power in the kingdom and sports plays a major role in his larger plan to project power abroad. And today we're going to turn our attention right back to football, to really the reason we're all gathered here in the first place, the World Cups, both men's and women's. And we're going to unpack the brand new, updated, now perfected bidding process in the new corruption proof FIFA <laughs> and how these firewalls prevented a rigged election. And I, I'm just kidding, Raj. Saudi Arabia is going to host the 2034 World Cup, right? Uh, by the way, the, the, the phrase corruption proof FIFA is like saying Roger with hair. Um, and I knew you were taking the piss when you said those words. It's honestly, it's like waterless ice. It would it would fundamentally go against the, the, the laws of nature. And Saudi Arabia, a nation where there's a male guardianship system in place, it requires women to have a male guardian, prevents them from choosing who this is. Yes, this is the nation that is, according to reports, aggressively pursuing the hosting rights for the 2035 Women's World Cup. I crap you not. It's honestly time to talk. Talk Saudi <laughs> Pro League, the top tier of football in Saudi Arabia, which has recently become one of Asia's more competitive realities, featuring teams like Al Hilal, which has won the Asian Champions League, a tournament featuring that continent's best clubs a record four times. The Saudi Pro League, their slogan is, hey, we're professionals. It says so right here. <laughs> in the name. And at the end of 2022, when Saudi Arabia was looking to send a message to the entire footballing world, they did not mess around. Here's our old mate, Tariq Panja, from your New York Times. It's hard to think of a bigger star than Cristiano Ronaldo. So are you, are you saying Cristiano Ronaldo, the underwear model, he still plays soccer? Yeah, you know, who says you can't have it all that remarkable? Uh, what is he? He's really a preening Portuguese show pony, one of the single greatest footballers the planet has ever seen. He's a gentleman that honestly played football to score goals, but only so that he could have an excuse to rip his shirt off and show his eight pack to the world. So he did it an incredible number of times. He's won every single club competition possible over and over and over. He scored more goals than God. Uh, in fairness, God struggled with injuries, Raj. But you were saying <laughs> that the Saudi Pro League, this footballing backwater, the equivalent of the Pioneer League or the Florida Complex League in baseball, was somehow able to lure one of the greatest players to ever play the game. H how does this happen? We've got to go back to late 2022. Come with me, Tommy, to a time when Ronaldo, that living brand, self-styled as CR7, was being forced to look for a new club after a turbulent second stint. At Manchester United had gone all wrong. United was a club where he'd made his name as a teenager. But this second time round, as an older gentleman, he was still scoring goals. But he was actually a liability for two reasons. Number one. He didn't like to run very much. And number two, he couldn't play as all modern footballers have to all over the field. He wouldn't do the defence, Tommy. 
Wait, you're telling me that Cristiano Ronaldo doesn't like to run with those abs? That is literally the only relatable thing I've ever heard about this guy. But his star power is such, Tommy, that despite his decline in play, Gent, he's one of the biggest global billboards in the world, still commands insane amounts of money. He almost priced himself out of a career in Europe, given what and who he is. Here comes Saudi Arabia. Cristiano Ronaldo playing in Saudi Arabia. You would not have thunk that a few years earlier. He pitches up at a team that few would have heard of, but one of the Saudi giants called Al Nassar. And there we go. Saudi Arabia has its first permanent mega pitch man. Two questions. One, what did Tarek mean by he almost priced himself out of a career in Europe? And two, how do we do that in podcasting? Do we have the thing to... I love about you, you always make it about yourself. I'm ready. <laughs> Whatever it takes. We do have to kidnap Joe Rogan. How do we make this happen? For Ronaldo, we do it all for the low, low price of 191 million a year, which is the single biggest sporting contract on the planet. And that money was, yes, for more than just football. It was more than about the goals. It was more than just about his trademark, iconic, famous, sweet celebration. Oh, that amount of money brought something else along with Ronnie to Riyadh. And suddenly, the conversation around the world is about the Saudi Arabian League, Cristiano Ronaldo, this club called Al Nasser. You go to the back streets of Bangkok or on the street markets in London, you're seeing not only the Manchester United knockoff shirts or the Real Madrid ones, you're seeing the yellow and blue of, of Al Nasser, which which means you've arrived. So Ronaldo starts his first game in 2023 and suddenly... That's all it took. Saudi league highlights are popping into every single football fan social media feed all over the world. It's almost like the first Instagram and social media league, if you want. They, these clips going viral is what this product seems to be. Part of the global football conversation without anyone actually wanting to watch a full Saudi professional match. In a way, it's football as entertainment in this bite-sized way. Like those clips of guys getting asked by their wives and girlfriends about how much they think about the Roman Empire, that kind of way? Exactly. And much more like the Roman Empire, Ronaldo's career expanded east before ultimately collapsing. Okay, so they're in my social media algorithm feed. They've got Ronaldo. I assume that was phase one. What's phase two? Next, it just comes a simple change at the top. This idea was to professionalize the Saudi Football League, which in, in many ways, despite occasionally spending money on, on, on salaries for foreign players, despite Al Hilal being a big team in Asia, w was run terribly in terms of how it was organized. This is not an image of the modern the thrusting, the new ambitious Saudi Arabia where uh, that was determined to build a modern sports economy. It doesn't work. So what they wanted was the the kind of modern blueprint. Who And who does that in Saudi Arabia? It seems all roads lead to the PIF. There they are, our good old pals, the Saudi <laughs> Public Investment Fund. I love fun acronyms like the PIF. Yeah, oh, the pith. Bite your arm off for a pith. And it was just last summer, feels longer, but that self-same pith bought 75% stakes in four of the biggest clubs in Saudi Arabia, Al-Hilal and al Nasser in Riyadh, al Etihad, and another Al, Al-Akhli in Jeddah. And may I presume that the Saudi Pro League doesn't have those pesky salary caps or even one of those profit and sustainability rules? Where we're going, Tommy, we don't need profit and sustainability rules. The list of players they brought in, it would take us an extra three episodes just to read them all out aloud. A deluge of transfers in exchange for inordinate piles of cash that sent shockwaves around the entire football world. Yeah, the transfer market has always been this chaotic trolley dash every summer. But this, this was something that I, I had not experienced before. And... The, 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 it was very interesting to see this in, in, in full flight because you, what you had was a group of Saudi businessmen holed up in hotels in European capitals doing a dizzying array of deals 
by the bucket load on a daily basis. And I know we've said we weren't going to read them all, but let's talk about a couple. We'll sprinkle some in. 31-year-old Brazilian star Neymar, who's half the professor from the AM1 mixtape tour, half footballer, and then if you could land me another half, I'd say manga comic book character all squashed together. They took him from Paris Saint-Germain to Al-Hilal, ethereal French talent, Kareem Big Body Benzema. He joined al Ittihad from the Spanish LA Lakers, Real Madrid. I mean, it's not hard to see what's leading these guys to make the jump to the Saudi league. It's just cold, hard cash. Yeah, they're definitely making more than we are from underwear ads, Tommy. I'm just saying. So that's it. Saudi Arabia's inexorable rise to become the greatest football league in the world has started. Yeah, in the words of that great poet philosopher Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. Well, we broke the news earlier this morning that Jordan Henderson has now completed his move from Liverpool to Al Etifak in Saudi Arabia for a fee of £13 million. Henderson had long been an advocate for LGBTQ plus rights. So we've got an LGBTQ plus rights advocate in the Saudi city of Damam. What could possibly go wrong? Tell us more about this Henderson character. Who is this Henderson? Um, that would be Jordan Henderson. And to tell his story, we called up, well, a gent who's last name. Is literally story. I'm Daniel Story. I'm the chief football writer for the I newspaper in the UK. Jordan Henderson, he was a, a midfielder and a facilitating midfielder, someone who did the dirty work and gave it to someone prettier and um, more effective and more skillful to do the rest. But he was a, a leader of men for Liverpool. He, he was the captain and he was a um, he was a leader by example. He grew up in the northeast. Uh, he's a, a Sunderland lad. He, he's, he's son of a policeman, working class family. Um, that area of, of northeast England is is proudly working class, is proudly industrial, um, is proudly football mad, and is is a, a kind of seen as the one of the the typical heartlands of of English football and of English working class culture. And Henderson was a you know a local boy done good. So. Is he like a English Kelsey brother without the podcast <laughs> and the whole, you know, dating Taylor Swift thing? Is that what I'm hearing? A minus about give or take a hundred pounds of muscle, but sure, if that helps you, I'll allow it. You know, Henderson is a fascinating human being. He's almost like a character ripped from from Greek tragedy. You know, he was vice captain of the England national team at a time when the England national team really gripped the nation's consciousness. And as Liverpool captain, he led that team uh, on a delirious first league title in 30 long years. He's a footballer who plays just with a tenacity, a determination. He gives everything of himself to his team he's absolutely beloved and he also became lauded as a role model and an ally for the lgbtq community as well as for a slew of cause i mean this guy was the ultimate use my football my sporting platform for the force of good he, he stepped up in moments of crisis particularly during the pandemic to support Britain's coveted but under, I mean, enormous financial pressures, NHS, the national health system. First of all, let me just be an American for a second. Uh, vice captain, that is that is adorable. It must be an honor to be vice captain when you make a <laughs> top four finish in your little league. Wonderful. But more importantly, Raj, I mean, he does sound like a genuinely good guy. Yeah, Jen stood so tall. I mean, literally and symbolically, um, he was self-styled. He really reveled in this position. He did. He he kind of. To, dipped his toe into it and then jumped into this pool and became the moral centre of the English game, a, a force of good, a moral authority who was listened to by every other player. When when Jordan Henderson spoke, everybody listened. Even if you were on an arch rival team, his word went and he was almost became, I mean, it's, this transcended football, transcended sports. He almost became the last sensible human being or the last sensible adult anyway, left in post-Brexit England. But with his LGBT stuff, that, that seemed to us to be front and centre of his campaigning work and his allyship. He, he activated Pride Month campaign. He, he, he wore the rainbow armband. He worked with Liverpool on their marketing material around Pride Month. This was something that went above and beyond his status as a Premier League captain. This was something that pertained to show us the real Jordan Henderson. Last summer, though, at age 33, Jordan Henderson suddenly found himself at a career crossroads. 33, Raj, that's your Jesus year. That's a great year. He should not worry about turning 33. So you say Henderson's at a crossroad. Is he like a little Britney Spears? Not a girl, not yet a woman. Are we talking 
Bone Thugs and Henderson, or any of these jokes landing with you, I can't even tell you. None of them, but I do love the idea of Jordan Henderson's Jesus year just spawning a world religion that would take root for centuries. What religion are you? Oh, I'm Hendo. I believe in Hendoism. Look, Tommy, Hendo, as he's known, he was old suddenly for a footballer, a lion in winter who played in the position that he had to be all over the field. Um, he was actually starting to not be all over the field. He was being phased out of the Liverpool team, which he believed he was meant to lead. He looked physically shattered after a gruelling season in which the Boston Red Sox Fenway Sports Group owned team made it to every single final possible before losing the two biggest trophies in agonizing fashion. I don't know why you felt the need to name my beloved Boston Red Sox and blame them for driving this poor man out of England during his Jesus here in his sandals, presumably, but I am offended. Hendo decided that rather than be put out to stud, essentially becoming like a mentor to, to young kids on the squad, eventually just evolving into an assistant coaching role, he would decamp for, as they say, greener pastures. And by greener in this case, we mean he left for bucket loads of money. Um, He arrived suddenly out of the blue. It was shocking when this was announced in Al Etifak in July 2023. Tommy, this is a man, remember, who was a champion of gay rights, someone who was praised for his empathy, for his humanity, as much as for his bloody football. Um, This, honestly, in England, it was the heel turn that no one saw coming. So basically, we got this clean-cut all-star sitting there in his letterman jacket, playing in a country where homosexuality is criminalized, for lack of a better metaphor. Yeah, it was it was startling news, and it all happened so unbelievably quickly. We didn't even have time for not to even to process it. We didn't have time for a double take. The reaction was was immediate. It was stark. It was it was severe. Um, Henderson played for for England at, at Wembley in the October and was booed by England supporters, LGBTQ England fans as part of the the Three Lions Pride group. They called him a sellout. They said they were beyond disappointed. So, yeah, this was an incredibly strong reaction. Raj, from everything you've told us about Henderson, at this point in his career, he was a good but not necessarily great player, right? So why would the Saudis want him so badly? Well, there's the surface answer, which was that Al Etifak had just hired a new manager, Liverpool's captain before Henderson, a gentleman called Steven Gerrard. Mahaba, Anna Steven Gerrard. Anna El Etifaki, see you soon. Arabic in a scout accent, never not funny. Gerard, Stevie Gila, he'd have personally known and he would personally have wanted Henderson to lift his entire team. You can tell by the layer of sweat glistening on Gerard's face that it took him about a dozen <laughs> takes to get that Arabic right. But was there a non surface answer for signing Henderson? Well, Daniel Story has a theory about that. It wasn't just about him as a name, it was about what he'd stood for and therefore what they could silence. This was such a symbolic signing, deliberately or otherwise, and I think it was deliberate. So the messaging was clear, or rather, the silencing of the message was clear. Even the club's social media announcing that they'd signed Jordan Henderson. The announcement on social media, it was all in grayscale, so all in black and white. So guess guess what? One of the things you don't see are all those shots of Jordan Henderson wearing... Uh, a rainbow armband uh, championing the LGBT community. And what proceeded to happen was surreal. Hendo, he played 19 times only. He had five assists, four yellow cards sprinkled in for Al Atifak. Um, And there was a flabbergasting interview that he chose to give to the Athletic to to try and justify the move, to try and defend himself, to try and quieten the outrage which had swept Britain. It's so hard to to have you outrage about yourself, sweet Britain. Uh, But instead, he only dug his grave deeper. He told the British media before he moved that he did not go there for the money. No, he wanted to grow football in Saudi Arabia. And suddenly he found himself there at al uh, One of the games was played in front of a derisory 696 fans. I'll say that again, 696 fans total. We established in episode one that Saudi Arabia actually has a legitimate and storied football culture. So why is nobody at these games? 
Tommy, you're asking all the right questions. Much of the culture stems from the support of the global game. You know, the Premier League, the Champions League. There's a true love, a deep-rooted knowledge and passion for the sport. And that exists all over Saudi Arabia. But that doesn't always translate into putting butts into the seats for the domestic game. And as you said, al Fak, which Jordan Henderson played for, it's not really one of Saudi Arabia's major clubs. It's based in the city of Damum. Put you close to the Bahrain border. It's on the outskirts of the country. It's on the periphery of the footballing scene. And the temperature highs, I mean, this is oil country, can hit 111 degrees in Oof. July, which is when Jordan Henderson was trying to play football. Um, don't know what SPF he was putting on before the games, but whatever it was, it wasn't enough. And it tells you all you need to know about the quality of the football he and the other players could conjure out there. So what does all this mean for Jordan Henderson? that just six months after he arrived, Hendo was gone. He just announced he was done, that he was actually going to go to Dutch top flight club Ajax. And to make things worse for Hendo, it's been reported that ultimately he deferred his roughly $450,000 a week wages for tax reasons. But because he left early, dude won't see a dime of it. I just feel incredibly sad for the whole thing. It's an incredibly bleak situation. It's someone that I, I, I believed in personally and he let us down. And I think he probably knows now that he let people down. Danny actually told me that Henderson now has gone from just this moral symbol of everything that's great about Britain to a walking cautionary tale. A gent who, when he's remembered, it won't be for the trophies he's lifted, the money that he raised for frontline healthcare workers during the pandemic lockdown, or even his charity work. It'll be for a very different job that he didn't even get paid for. It will certainly take his legacy long term in English football as a whole. Um, he has unwittingly, uh, or he will unwittingly become the poster boy of uh, moral hypocrisy of sporting stars. I think it, it will become a, a kind of a morality tale, a, an Icarus tale of, of someone who flew too close to to the sun, quite literally, given the 95% humidity. We'll strap on our wings and set sail straight for the sun, or at least towards another blazing hot Middle Eastern World Cup right after this break. World Corrupt is brought to you by Zbiotics. Uh, I got to tell you, Raj, about this game-changing product that I use before any night out with drinks. It's called Zbiotics. I feel like we've had this conversation somewhere before, Tommy. Oh, yes. It was on our last two episodes. That's, that never happened, so I'm going to tell you about it again, Raj, because <laughs> that's the way podcast ads work. That's such a life truth. So go ahead, Thomas. So as I told you for the first time, Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Oh, Dr. Thomas, I owe dehydration an apology. <laughs> you and me both. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night, drink responsibly, then you'll feel your best tomorrow. Please tell me there's a great vanity URL coming. <laughs> Go to zbiotics.com slash corrupt. To get 15% off your first order, when you use the code CORRUPT at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money-back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com slash corrupt and use the code CORRUPT at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics, for sponsoring this episode and our good times. Is this company known in England as Zbiotics? World Corrupt is brought to you by the Human Rights Foundation. Are you a World Corrupt fan? You know I am. You only have to look at my burner account for evidence of that. <laughs> at guilt ridden Everton fan 203. I see you, pal. You're one of my favorite <laughs> follows. And for all of you listening to this, then you want to mark your calendars for June 3rd to 5th because of the 2024 Oslo Freedom Forum is heading back to Norway. Oslo Freedom Forum. And that conjures images of an incredible 1980s music festival. You have one featuring Tracy Chapman, Springsteen, and your mate Rick Astley Thomas. <laughs> Close, Raj. At the 2024 Oslo Freedom Forum, you'll hear from courageous individuals who are pushing boundaries, challenging oppression, and driving positive change. Don't miss this opportunity to be part of the global movement for freedom and democracy. Visit Oslo Freedom Forum dot com 
Go today to get your tickets and use the promo code CROOKED for 40% off day passes. That's oslofreedomforum.com. Use the promo code CROOKED. Oh, I'm dreaming of an acoustic version of Never Gonna Give You Up Now, Tell Me. Okay, Raj, so Saudi Arabia is setting up a league that might be great or might be the fire Festival of Football. It sort of depends, you know, if you're content living in a golden palace but playing in front of dozens of fans. Oh, your rule is proper, I'll let it fact, tell me. <laughs> I'm going to try this. This heat is murder. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. 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 <laughs> if I find you funny, I won't say that was very funny, tell me. It's murder. <laughs> nope. Uh, but let's say this all does work out and Saudi Arabia achieves its goal of having a top 10 league in the world. That's one thing. Winning the right to host a World Cup, that's another thing entirely, right? That's true, Thomas. And it includes countries pulling out all the bloody stops with dazzling infrastructure proposals that take years to build. And in some cases, even Morgan bloody Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Raj is referring to the failed US bid to host the 2022 World Cup in which we, the United States, trotted out Morgan Freeman. The best of us. The best of us. And there was some talk on season one of World Corrupt from guest and a former Justice Department official named Matt Miller friend of mine who was in attendance at the U.S. bid effort that he might have uh, mailed it in a little bit, Mr. Freeman. Morgan Freeman oh, ended up getting that bag. And you think the idea of Morgan Freeman in front of FIFA, football's global governing body, is surreal. Wait until I tell you about the bidding for the 2034 World Cup. But before we get into this 2034 World Cup process, just a quick reminder of how the process works. You have 211 national soccer associations that vote. And once a continent hosts the World Cup, it has to wait two more cycles before it can host again. The idea is to spread the tournament around the globe and do it more equitably. It's a very noble idea, Tommy. And in 2030, everyone was bidding. Honestly, felt like half the member nations wanted football to come Oh, two, that spotlight that it brings, that sense of wonder. Uh, that I mean, it's like a national trophy. Everybody but he wanted it. And the ever-benevolent FIFA decided to match that passion by spreading the 2030 competition across three continents. It will be played in South America, in Europe, and also in Africa. <laughs> the three continents, the logistics of that are absurd. It's actually right. So Spain... Portugal and Morocco, they're technically the host countries. But because 2030, it's actually the 100th year anniversary of the first ever World Cup was held in 1930 in Uruguay. FIFA decided in its infinite wisdom, by infinite wisdom, I do mean infinite craftiness. uh, This was a complete and utter shock. This was complete left field when it happened that Uruguay, Argentina and Paraguay would have the honour, a ceremonial honour of hosting the first, second and third games. But get this. And this is, this is a bit crazy, but it's important to follow this because the outcome will blow your mind. FIFA actually has a rule, and the rule is this. The World Cup can't be hosted in the same continent more than once every 12 years. And because you suddenly had three continents, Africa through Morocco, Europe had Spain and Portugal, and then you had your South America with your, your Uruguays, your Argentinas, your Paraguays hosting 2030 together meant that every nation in all of those continents was suddenly ineligible, eliminated from the possibility of hosting 2034. Remember, North America, they'll have hosted World Cup 2026, the United States, Mexico and Canada. So that left, here it is, for 2034 hosting purposes, the only continents that could possibly do the honours, Asia and Oceania. They were the last continent standing. What a clear, simple system FIBA has here, Raj. Makes total sense. But that's still a lot of countries. Are you telling me that none of them wanted a little World Cup in their lives? None of these other folks? Well, Tommy, not exactly. It's not that they didn't want it. It's more that FIFA, along with the announcement of these weird and kind of jerry-rigged hosting realities, they also announced a surprise immediate 25-day deadline on future bids for that 2034 tournament. Surprise! Here's Tarek. And let's just take a second to think what a World Cup is. It's multi-billion dollars of infrastructure work often. You're going to need your public on side. So if you're a democratic country, this is going to be a really, really big decision. Uh, Saying, can you you tell us that you're going to be up for this in 25 days is, is going to be an impossibility for many of these countries. And yet, 
just hours after FIFA made that announcement, Saudi Arabia, what a coincidence, they told the world, we're in! It's almost like they, I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, um, and I know I'm going to sound a little Alex Jonesy here, but it's almost, Tommy, like they knew it was coming. So, But surely some other country wanted in on this process, right? They could trot out their own version of Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, Indonesia and Australia, and I would love to meet the Indonesian version of Morgan Freeman and the Australian version of Morgan Freeman equally. They'd successfully hosted the Women's World Cup, by the way, Australia in 2023, uh, along with New Zealand. They were publicly mulling over the idea of a bid. But I can't tell you how fast this all went down, Tommy. Press releases flying minutes after another, pedestrians having to duck and dodge on the street for fear of being hit by a stray press release. <laughs> Just as Saudi Arabia announced its bid within minutes of FIFA's press release, there was another announcement from the Asian Football Confederation, which Australia is a part of, Indonesia is a part of, and guess who? Saudi Arabia is a part of, to say that Asia is four square behind the Saudi Arabian World Cup bid. That was news to the Australians, I'll tell you that. And suddenly this, this has just happened. In the end... After a lengthy, and I'm being quite sarcastic with the use of the word lengthy, three and a half weeks, which FIFA gave everybody to prepare. And it has to be said, a FIFA bid is a deeply complex bid. It's almost like a an infrastructure bill. There's no way it could be put together in that time frame. Australia and Indonesia did the only thing that was available for them to do. They announced they wouldn't have the time to put their bids together after all. And suddenly, oh, for Saudi Arabia, mission accomplished. I've yet to hear a, a, an explanation for, for any of this that makes any coherent sense rather than this was a World Cup they wanted to deliver to Saudi Arabia. By they, I mean the, the hierarchy at FIFA. In this case, Saudi Arabia has essentially been gifted the World Cup. It is the only candidate somehow for the 2034 World Cup. So by design... It doesn't have to do any of that stuff that Qatar was accused of doing. It knows it's already got the World Cup pending this rubber stamping vote of the FIFA Congress uh, at some point this year. (laughs) If I'm Qatari, I'll be kind of frustrated. Oh, my God, we had to go through all of that. Look at these guys. (laughs) They just get it on a plate. Qatar, I'll briefly remind you, Raj, the downer that I am on the show, was the deadliest World Cup on record. 15,021 non-Qataris died in the decade leading up to the 2022 World Cup. They were working in brutally hot conditions to build all the infrastructure required for Qatar to host. Is FIFA at all concerned that this could happen again? You'll be delighted to hear, Tommy, that FIFA actually got its act together. There was a sea change ahead of the bidding for these 2030 and 34 World Cups. FIFA now demands that its hosts will abide by the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights. Tommy, you know Saudi Arabia uh, in a way I do not. So so I'm sure they'll comply. So... Raj, I got some bad news for you. Uh, Human Rights Watch points out that there's no due diligence possible in Saudi Arabia, thanks to the government basically suppressing anyone who might try to come in and check it out. And so you can't fail the exam if you don't write your name on it, if you don't turn it in. That's sort of the problem here. And without labor unions or the ability to strike or protest, workers essentially have no recourse. So, Raj, I mean, is this is this new FIFA bidding process just to not have a bidding process? We detailed in season one of World Corrupt the fallout from the bidding process for Russia and Qatar uh, with dozens of executives in FIFA. They're actually arrested or charged with, with corruption, with bribery, with racketeering. It's the largest corruption scandal in the history of football's world governing body, FIFA. Swiss police working with the FBI and the IRS came in and arrested up to uh, seven people are now arrested, uh, top members of FIFA's board. Well, this is seen just moments ago in Miami. Federal agents raid one of the headquarters under fire. You know, this is about the members of the group who decide where the World Cup will be played. They're charged with taking tens of millions of dollars in bribes. Look, we joked earlier that we'd cured sports washing for good. That obviously was not true. The podcast didn't solve it, Raj. But that was one of your less funny jokes. <laughs> <Tommy>. <laughs> yeah, but there were two waves of U.S. Department of Justice indictments that were actually supposed to change things within FIFA and root out corruption. Surely that threat of jail time forced some changes in that organization, right? 
here's Tarek again to crush. Oh, sweet Tommy, your pure, innocent dreams. And it just shows you how embedded the culture is, not even a DOJ indictment against some of football's top leaders, not even people being dragged out of their bed from a luxury hotel at 6am in Zurich. None of these things can, can shame and change football in that meaningful way. It feels like everything has gone back into place in a way that looks a bit like Terminator 2. If you've ever seen that movie, there's the villain, I think he was called T-1000. You kind of fire at him and then he kind of reconstitutes himself. And Tommy, this point was really driven home in, in an astounding way um, by news in early March um, from FIFA in a press release that the Under-17 World Cup will now take place every single year as opposed to every other year as it has done for the longest time. And the first five of those tournaments, they'll all be held in Qatar. The first five in Qatar. So it's impressive that despite all the outcry over the Qatar World Cup, that not only did FIFA learn zero lessons, but they just quadrupled down, quintupled down. What's the one for five on shitty autocrats? That's what you're telling me? Learning zero lessons. Now it's my turn to find someone relatable. Oh, FIFA, you've never made more sense to me. You've never, FIFA and me, we've never sounded more alike. <laughs> so, Raj, this all reminds me of something uh, that the former FIFA Secretary General, Jerome Velk, said in a press conference <laughs> once, out loud, in public. Again, this was in front of cameras. Uh, quote, I will say something which is crazy, but less democracy is sometimes better for organizing a World Cup. When you have a very strong head of state who can decide, as maybe Putin can do in 2018, that's easier for us as organizers. Yes, Raj, an emboldened Putin making decisions on his own. What could go wrong? Talking about it might be crazy uh, to say that. Yes, Jerome, that was indeed a crazy thing to say. Unrelated point. Velk was later convicted <laughs> on corruption charges in Switzerland uh, in their federal criminal court. But what's the motive behind all this? Given that many of their predecessors at FIFA have faced jail time, why tilt the scale so blatantly in Saudi Arabia's favor? The same reason pretty well anyone does anything nowadays. Oil money. Mm. Like they say about the families, Raj. Blood is thicker than water, but far less lucrative than oil. Yeah, the 2018 World Cup back in Russia, that was sponsored by whom? By Gazprom, who just happens to be Russia's state-controlled energy gas distribution company. The 2022 World Cup, you see in a theme here, Tommy, sponsored by Qatar Airways and Visit Saudi, bizarrely. But the 2034 World Cup, it's brought FIFA a new sponsor. I'm going to guess Patagonia. <laughs> That's the kind of football I want to watch. Um, but no, welcome Saudi Aramco, officially known as the Saudi Arabian Oil Group. Aramco is Saudi Arabia's money tap, essentially. It is the state oil company um, in the hundreds of billions when we talk about revenue and profit. It is the big cash cow that funds a lot of this it was um, floated, part of it was floated on the stock exchange. It was the biggest IPO in history. So um, that's the scale that we're talking about. Um, and Aramco quickly becomes a FIFA sponsor foot in the door. And, and we're talking north of, I don't want to, I'm going to be speculating here or talking about other people's reporting, but the, the figures we've heard are around the $100 million a year mark. Well, that's it. The sad end of the story, Saudi Arabia gets a World Cup, right? FIFA gets a new sponsor. We all go home, dispirited, defeated, but we watch anyway, right? Right. Yeah, right, Tommy. That's how football works. Really? That's it? Usually you say something even worse whenever I ask a question like that. It's sort of a pregnant I, pause, and then you brutalize me. I'm, I'm not going to run at a football like Charlie Brown again with, with, with Lucy Holden. I don't have it in me to let you down again, Thomas. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we definitely aren't going to talk about Saudi Arabia's bid for the 2035 Women's World Cup. God damn it, Roger. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Wise. 
the account that helps you manage your money all around the world. Dining in dollars, doing business in BAT. The Men and Blazers Media Network only does business almost exclusively now in BAT, Tommy. With our good friends at Wise, it's all possible, Raj, because wherever life takes you, the Wise account lets you send, spend, and receive money in different currencies. Wise is the easy way to connect all of your finances internationally. Oh, buying that dream property in Portugal, done. Freelancing in France, no problem. Sending money back to my mum, simple. Tommy, oh, my mum loves little more than a box of chocolates and a bundle of bat. And <laughs> she probably loves when it comes without hidden fees or exchange rate markups. Wise works in over 160 countries, so your money's always at your fingertips. Join 16 million customers and learn how the Wise account could work for you by downloading the app or visiting wise.com slash crooked world. Oh, my mom, oddly enough, loves exchange rate markups. World Corrupt is brought to you by the Council on Foreign Relations podcast, Why It Matters. Podcast sponsoring other podcasts. Tommy, have we crossed into some kind of new media utopia? So the the podcast singularity, Raj. (laughs) It's a shame because I was hoping we'd get some kind of podcast beef this season. But Why It Matters is a truly excellent listen. In each episode, host Gabrielle Sierra asks guests about the basics on a wide range of global topics, providing a little bit of humor and an eagerness to learn alongside the listener. This season of the show, we'll be tackling questions like, why is the government so secretive about UFOs? Is there more dissent in Chinese society than America understands? And why did a group of foreign policy experts say that the biggest global threat of 2024 isn't coming from Russia or North Korea, but right here in the United States? Check out the new season of Why It Matters and other great Council on Foreign Relations podcasts by visiting cfr.org slash podcasts or subscribe wherever you get your audio. That's cfr.org or subscribe to Why It Matters today. To end this episode, we're going to talk about Saudi Arabia's push into women's soccer in particular, their designs on hosting the 2035 Women's World Cup. Yeah, and to tell this story, I'm going to take you back into the deepest past, all the way. We're going all the way, Tommy, to the beginning of women's soccer in Saudi Arabia, which means going all the way back to 2018. (laughs) That's the year that women were first legally allowed to attend football matches even in Saudi Arabia. Ah, I see. So this is right about the time that women were given the right to drive in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which was part of Mohammed bin Salman's broader social reforms that we talked about in the past episode, which, by the way, coincided with the arrests of many women who have been fighting for those changes in the first place. Then we have to leap forward so many years to February 2020. Come with me. Um, I'm old enough to remember those days when they launched the amateur Saudi Women's Football League. The Saudi Arabian Women's National Football Team actually didn't play their first games until 2022. So I'm going to go all American on you again and just ask the question I asked in episode (laughs) one. Do they win? Do they do the winning, Raj? Well, Tommy, uh, for that to happen, they, you know, they'd actually have to play some competitive games to do any of that winning stuff. Um, and so far, they've restricted their activities uh, to mere glorified friendlies. I think what you call in America exhibition games. Glorified friendlies. That sounds nice. That's, that's, that's what our relationship is, right? Uh, not playing, you know, the actual games has not stopped the Saudis from announcing an ardent desire to be the host for the 2035 Women's World Cup. Uh, through the Saudi Arabian women's team's technical director, Monica Staub. So if, if they're not playing any games, I take it they've never qualified for a Women's World Cup before? Well, there is a loophole here, Tommy, because for any of these tournaments, one way to qualify, the easiest way, is to just host the entire damn thing. You then automatically qualify, a bit like Qatar did for the Men's World Cup that they hosted in 2022. Ah, I love a good loophole. So is that it? Is that the whole thing? That's the motive there? They just want to qualify for the competitions? Or do we think there's something deeper? Well, we asked Tariq this question. Oh, in terms of who benefits from this, certainly Mohammed bin Salman. He has this this big prize to show his population. I've I've bought you this World Cup. The eyes of the world are going to be on Saudi Arabia, and I've managed to make it happen. And also, you know, people we don't talk about and think about a lot are the kind of enablers, the enabler economy. And these are the Western consultants, lawyers, bankers, who make all of this happen in the background. And they have walked away probably with um, a very, very fat uh, bank balance as a result of this. And then, you know, in terms of 
FIFA. You look at FIFA and you say, well, I'm sure they're going to do well over 11 years when it comes to sponsorship agreements and the like over there. So the story is a few people stand to make a ton of money. That tracks with this series. But Raj, what's the reaction been like? I mean, we have a country here that treats women like second class citizens hosting the Women's World Cup. That is clearly absurd, right? Just brazenly, obviously ridiculous on its face. I mean, brazen is the word, Tommy. Uh, it's so brazen. I think, honestly, everyone's still pretty stunned at the moment. It was all announced with just such a whirlwind whiplash. Like, what? But I will say the women players themselves have protested the most vociferously. Visit Saudi, for instance, tried to sponsor the 2023 Women's World Cup in Australia. And it was met with such a ferocious backlash that FIFA, uh, after announcing the plan, had to quickly drop them. So many elite players in the women's game, obviously, are openly gay. And many others are big supporters of LGBTQ rights. And, and I can imagine they don't relish the idea of visiting a place where homosexuality is criminalized. They most certainly do not. Um, and my colleague on Men in Blazers Media Network's newest podcast, The Women's Game, the mighty Sam Lewis, a World Cup winner in her own right. And she recently had a fellow World Cup champion and World Cup season one guest, Megan Rapino, on her show. And the two of them, they talked about this very issue. What message would that send if Saudi Arabia got a bid to host the World Cup? I don't love it. Um I, it's it's that's a really tough one. I think there's there's a, a few things you have to think about. Like having the World Cup in Saudi Arabia for women in Saudi Arabia would probably be amazing to be able to see that, to see women like you know in their sort of full sport element, um, living out a type of life and equality that is not afforded to them. So that is not lost on me. But I think with FIFA in particular, I mean, this is like, this to me is just like such a blatant money power play. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, the Saudi Arabian government has been making a huge play into sports. It's basically sport washing. Um, mm. I mean, I think we have to allow for progress and we have to allow for the game to go to different places. But if it's only going to work to sort of cover up the existing inequalities or, or use, you know, sport as sport washing, particularly women's sports, because I think women's sports, it's like, if it goes there, it's, it's like rubber stamping a lot of these inequalities. Like are gay players just going to be given a pass? Is Quinn going to be able to play? Like, are they going to be safe? Are they going to be around? Are their friends and family? Like, we just don't know. I mean, that's just, that's, those are ginormous question marks and things that make me very uncomfortable. And then, you know, even just uh, on the investment side, obviously we've seen, you know, the men's Saudi Arabian league, you know, just put forth like crazy contracts, live golf, stuff like that. They're, they're getting in, in so many different ways because the money that they're splashing is, you know, sort of like, unable to be resisted. But I'm like, why? It, it, to me, I, I just have never felt like money is the only thing that we need to go after. And, and like the biggest price tag isn't necessarily the best. And I just worry that it would do more harm to the women's game than it would do good um, rather than having it in, in a different country that has much more of a, a genuine, legitimate focus on women's rights and, and human rights at large. I'd encourage you to listen to that entire conversation uh, on the women's game uh, with Sam Lewis. Uh, just search women's game wherever you get your podcast and you can hear more. But I've got to be candid, Tommy. The worldwide response to Saudi Arabia hosting the 2034 World Cup uh, and wanting the 2035 women's version of it. It's, well, it's almost been, I'd categorize it I don't, as a deep sigh, almost a shrug. The one thing that struck me is how little comment and criticism there has been from the footballing fraternity elsewhere. If you remember, Roger, we, we were around back then. When Qatar came out of the envelope, there was uproar in Europe. You're going to have to move the European calendar. The clubs are going to be furious. We're going to have to have the World Cup in November and December. Almost certainly will again. And um, the players are going to be tired with these long seasons. We haven't 
heard a peep really out of any of those people who were protesting before. And maybe people have got inured to this. We've got a bit jaundiced. This is what happens now. Qatar is conditioned this or maybe something else. Maybe the fact that, you know, don't upset um, Saudi Arabia because they could do a deal with you soon as well. So perhaps, um, again, that, that money that can be brought to bear to club owners, to, to leagues, etc., might make the, 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 the vitriol one might have expected not show up at this point. Raj, it's safe to say this hasn't been the most uplifting episode we've ever done. Yeah, started from the bottom. And now we, it feels like we've found a new bottom, Tommy. <laughs> Another great I'm tagline. Proud, I'm always proud of how low we're feeling in this moment. <laughs> Cheer me up then, Thomas, would you? You may only hope. What's coming up in our final episode of this series? Coming up next, we're talking about how the Saudi goalposts just keep on moving. From sports to Silicon Valley to Hollywood, it seems like Mohammed bin Salman's ambitions know no bounds. And it's not just the footballers who are turning a blind eye. Don't mind me, just going to shut the light off and hide under my desk until then, like Jordan Henderson. 